In the middle of modern-day Turkey lies a region that was under siege for centuries. This lunar landscape is called Cappadocia. Jeez, it's magnificent. And beneath its quaint villages, roads, and farmlands is one of the largest subterranean battlefields in the world. First carved out by the pagan Hittites over 3,000 years ago, hundreds of underground cities span for miles and have endured the bloody wars, religious battles, and constant conflict that have always threatened to destroy them. From tunnels rigged with booby traps. Those are for the spears. They kill the enemy by the head. Oof, and that's not going to be pretty. To the clandestine roots of Christianity. This is the first monastery of the world, and it's huge. There are approximately a couple hundred churches around this area. And the remains of an advanced pagan civilization that mysteriously disappeared. Cappadocia has secrets inside every cave. Let's go up here and take a look. And around every corner. It's like a, a beehive. It's a honeycomb of tunnels that just go in every direction. Signs of the evolution of ancient warfare have been buried for more than 3,000 years. We're peeling back the layers of time on Cities of the Underworld. Secret Pagan Underground. For thousands of years, this mysterious region has been a battlefield for invading empires. But hidden beneath its quaint villages and bizarre terrain lie massive underground cities and traces of a mysterious pagan empire dating back 4,000 years. I'm Don Wildman. I'm in Cappadocia, Turkey, land of lost cities. This lunar landscape was created millions of years ago by the eruption of three huge volcanoes, and it is unlike any in the world. For thousands of years, people here have been digging in the soft volcanic rock, creating a vast mega metropolis below ground. There's over a hundred square miles filled with heavily fortified castles, secret churches, dungeons, entire underground cities built to defend the locals against the armies of history's most powerful empires. For generations, villagers have guarded the secrets of Cappadocia's underworld. But as the modern world collides with the ancient one, those dark secrets are revealed. The region of Cappadocia is located 200 miles south of Ankara, the capital of the modern Republic of Turkey. It sits in the center of the high desert of central Anatolia, a nearly 300,000 square mile peninsula that encompasses most of the country. This region has always been the center of mysterious activity, from supposed magnetic fields with healing powers that locals swear by, to a history of UFO sightings going back thousands of years. Today, its unique landscape makes it a popular tourist destination, but its dramatic terrain conceals a hidden world. Throughout the region, hundreds of underground cities and fortresses dug into the mountains connect to create one of the most massive subterranean networks in the world, where entire civilizations fought their bloody last stands and secret religions were spawned. I was on a quest to find the mysteries that lay hidden in this otherworldly region. My first stop was a towering rock column called Uchisar. I've been told this is one of the most important and oldest citadels. This huge rock right here. It's all dug out with tunnels all throughout. Man, it's incredible. Look at this. I mean, it's just like this over here. All the tunnels all throughout. And this entire valley is just like one huge underground. Let's go up here and take a look. Oh yeah, you can see how much they've dug out here. Whatever this was. It's just a huge amount of effort gone into this. Incredible. Look at this. It doesn't smell so good in here. 3,500 years ago, this was one of the three major citadels in the region for the pagan tribes that lived here. These rock fortresses were the key to survival in those brutal days, a time when tribal warfare could wipe out entire villages. It's like a, a beehive. It's a honeycomb of, of tunnels that just go in every direction. 
Wow. As a natural high point overlooking the valley, Uchisar made for the perfect defensive location. But how did primitive ancient people dig this massive structure out of solid rock? To find out, you have to jump back millions of years to when volcanic eruptions created this totally unique moonscape here on Earth. Over millions of years, the three major volcanoes surrounding the region spewed volcanic materials across the land. The first eruptions left a layer of soft rock called tufa. The subsequent eruptions left a much harder layer of basalt. This dense material created a protective surface that slowed the erosion of the underlying tufa. Eventually, rain and wind blowing sand into the tufa rock began to erode it, creating these huge plateaus and fairy chimney rock formations that span for miles. The tufa was soft and easy to carve, but why go through the trouble of digging a city out of the earth instead of building one up above? Cappadocia's long and bloody history may give us a clue. Cappadocia was always a highly coveted and equally dangerous piece of real estate. It sat directly in the center of the major trade routes that connected the world's great empires, from China, India, and Egypt in the east, to Greece and Rome in the west. That meant whoever controlled Cappadocia controlled the trade routes, and was guaranteed a hefty share of all the riches carried along it. Everyone from the Romans to the Persians to the Mongols fought bloody battles to control it. That and tribal warfare made this a dangerous place to call home. Oftentimes, the local pagan population found themselves drastically outnumbered and outgunned. So to defend themselves, they had to create another world below the ground. The soft tufa rock left behind by the volcanic ash that blanketed the region 10 million years before was easy to carve, and the hard basalt layer on top provided protection, so the Cappadocians started to dig. They began with simple rock shelters and eventually transformed those into huge underground cities and fortresses like here at Ujisar. Some of these subterranean cities could support as many as 20,000 people and did so for 25 centuries up until the 1300s. Locals relied on their underground cities to keep them alive. But when the Ottoman Empire finally stabilized this region in the 14th century, villages began to thrive on top. And some of these cities that saved their ancestors were sealed up and forgotten. In the 1960s, locals started to explore the closed-off tunnels beneath their homes. They had heard rumors of their ancestors' subterranean existence, but no one could imagine how vast these cities were. Today, over 200 cities have been found intact beneath Cappadocia. Experts believe there are hundreds more just waiting to be discovered. I'm in Urgup, the main city in this area. There's one woman here who knows everything there is to know about Cappadocia. I'm gonna go see her now. Elva. Hi, Don. How are Hi, you? Hi, good. So this is your hometown, huh? Yes, this is Irgip, one of the main towns of uh, Cappadocia. Uh -huh. I can see there's a rock formation right here in town. They're everywhere. This is just the beginning. Elvan Osbey has been exploring this underground for nearly 20 years, and no one knows Cappadocia's hidden secrets like her. She wanted to take me to a place you couldn't find on any tourist map. It was an untouched underground city belonging to the region's first empire, the mighty Hittites. The Hittites are considered to be one of the most advanced empires of the ancient world. They reigned from 1700 BC to 1190 BC and are thought to be the first Cappadocians to start living underground. But what did they have to be afraid of? No one knows for sure, but their ancient writings reference a time of troubles from invaders they called the Sea People. The pagan Hittites appear to have flourished in the region for over 500 years. But in the 12th century BC, like another great and mysterious civilization, the Mayans, they vanished without a trace. The underground of Cappadocia was their last refuge, and I was going to see one of their very first subterranean cities. Elvon was taking me to go to Toprek, a place few outsiders have ever seen. Villagers have always known of its existence, but the rest of the world is just now learning about it. Where are we going here? Well, we're going up there. That's the original entrance of the underground city. Oh, really? So these caves go throughout this entire it face does, of rock? It actually, yes. And the villagers say, all around, wherever you see this rock formation, there are caves and tunnels. God, cool. So this is the entrance here? This is the entrance here, and this is the original. It's oh, very really? rare. Mostly the original entrance is collapsed, you know? Uh-huh. Wow. 
watch the spider web there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is not open, I'm telling yes. you. Yes. Oh, but it's a big room in here. Wow, look at this. Look at the bats. With the exception of treasure hunters who scour this region looking for treasures left behind from the mysterious Hittites, the underground city here has been mostly untouched. Elvon said its crude construction meant it was one of the first and oldest cities. Cappadocians became more advanced in underground living as the threat up above forced them deeper and deeper into the ground. As rival tribes or the mysterious sea people approached, these villagers abandoned their lives up above and prepared to wait it out down below. What are these holes over here? They're the wells for water storage. There are two kinds of wells. Uh -huh. These are called dry wells. This is where you store the water. Okay, so the water was brought here? Yeah, brought here and stored okay. in here. It's poured right in. Yeah. And there's another system, which is called the wet well. And they grew these waterways and then direct the water inside the underground city oh. and then directly into the well. So it was like a, an aqueduct, a primitive aqueduct system. Uh, yeah. They had water, specially carved out ventilation shafts, and months supplies of food. But that wasn't enough. They needed protection. Throughout these narrow tunnels snaking from room to room in the underground city were remnants of an ancient defensive system used during times of siege. They've got another defense here, another millstone to roll into place because I guess there's an important room down this way. Millstones weighing up to a ton were rolled in front of the entrances to shut off access into parts of the city. It was simple and genius. Because the stones were round, inside the rooms just a few men could easily roll one of these stones into place. But from the other side, even an army couldn't budge it. This was the first evidence of the complexity of life in these underground cities. And who knows how many ancient people died right here, fighting in these tunnels. <laughs> Here's... This millstone's actually in place. It's been rolled into block away. And, I mean, this has been here for 3,000 years, because no mortal man, certainly not me, can move it. You can see... Oh, yeah. Down this hole, the tunnel just continues on. But we ain't going there. I had already found evidence of an underground battlefield and advanced engineering left behind by the pagan Hittites. But what I had just seen was only the beginning. Up next, an underground fortress to defend against a violent siege. Those are for the spears. They kill the enemy by the head. Oof, and that's not going to be pretty. And later... These are, are graves here. Huh? Yeah, they're children's graves. Oh, wow. Digging up the mysterious roots of Christianity. Cappadocia is a hot spot for UFO sightings. In the early 80s, hundreds were reported in less than one year's time. Four thousand years ago, the Hittites, a powerful and advanced pagan empire, arrived in Cappadocia and around 1200 BC dug into this volcanic soil to create lethal military forts. They lived like ants in their subterranean cities, warding off invaders. When they mysteriously vanished in the 12th century BC, they left massive hand-carved cavities beneath the ground. Cavities that would become increasingly useful in the first century AD, when another persecuted group, the Christians, came to town. And in Osganok, a small village in the northern region of Cappadocia, this exotic new religion was able to take root and flourish underground. I met up again with Elvon, who knows the underground of Cappadocia better than anyone else. Because Osganok is the third largest underground city in Cappadocia, the local government installed a secure entrance to prevent treasure hunters from stealing any precious artifacts. This is the entrance. Excellent. Let's go. But I was granted special access inside, and once in, I knew exactly what they were protecting.
Wow, so this is the carved out stone, see? Yes, and we're at the first floor of this underground city, which was used as a stable. Okay. They were bringing their animals in with them uh -huh. and tying them here. Oh, I see. So yeah. they actually roped them up. They roped them up. And they carved them right out of the rock. Yeah. What yeah. is this, uh, these openings along? These openings are for their eating. Oh, I see. This is their dish. So this is totally functional. There's just functional, a bunch of hay there. This and is where they eat. Oh, my God. Look, there. So there's a space above? Space above, space be below. below. Jeez, Everywhere, it yeah, ventilation. Keeps going on. Yes. We were standing on the first level of a multi level city. The animals occupied the first level, and the villagers took cover on the second level, 18 feet beneath the ground. In fact, over 3,000 people could live in this massive complex for months at a time. It was essentially an ancient version of a modern bomb shelter. If they went to all this trouble to build something so far underground and so vast, the threat they were facing must have been enormous. When they were first attacked by the Arabs, they were throwing burning bushes through the shafts. The ventilation yes. shafts. And people were in the first floors were dying because of the smoke. So they decided to go deeper and wider. They needed more protection every year. As the military threat grew, so did the undergrounds. That's exactly what happened. It all started in the first century AD, when Christians began to use the underground to escape persecution from Roman soldiers. In the year 303, the last and most aggressive persecution was launched. Thousands of Christians throughout the empire were hunted and killed. But it didn't end there. Muslim Arab armies continued the Christian persecution, but when they arrived in the villages up above, they found a ghost town. Three secret tunnels in the village and passageways underneath homes allowed the Christians to quickly retreat to safety. Once the invading armies realized the villagers were sitting ducks beneath their feet, the real battle began. But little did they know, the Christians were ready. In the underground cities, you have very narrow and winding, slopey tunnels. Okay. The first reason is air circulation. When you have these slopes, the air circulates much faster and better. So it compresses the air. Compresses almost. the oh, air and directs to all around the underground city. The second purpose is for the enemy. Yeah. You cannot go all together. You and I cannot walk in there together. So this is We a need to go one by one mm -hmm. and we need to bend down. <laughs> And if we have weapons, we need to put them down yeah. and like walking like this. Okay. So, so this, this is disarms the reason. The enemy. Yes, this arms the enemy. Ah, interesting. That's why. Oh, that's cool. The narrow tunnel would slow the enemy assault to a crawl. And for those determined enough to go through, there were more surprises ahead. What are these? Those are for the spears. The spears? Yeah, just in case the enemy gets all the way here. Oh my god. Yeah. So they're act oh, I can see all the way up here. Yes. So they, they kill the enemy by the head. So the if, if you've gotten this far in your attack, you're not going to go any farther because <laughs> no, they, got, you're they dead. got you this way. <laughs> wow. Oof, and that's not going to be pretty. But the defensive traps didn't end there. Yeah. All right. Even if you were saved from the spears, uh -huh. you can't go any further because of this. The door will be closed in front of you. This door comes in, into play. It was a millstone used to trap an enemy, just like the ones I had seen at Gotsu Toprek. And while the Christians have the Hittites to thank for first carving out these fortresses centuries before, they deserve the credit for taking the idea of a subterranean booby-trapped battlefield to a whole new level. One of the new tactics they came up with was to let the invading armies enter a main room roll the millstones to cover the only two entrances and essentially trap the army inside until they died. As if that wasn't enough, just beyond the door was yet another deadly obstacle. In this room, up here, this is a very famous Byzantine system. Pour hot oil over the enemy. So you've managed to get inside this inside. room. Inside? Now you're killed there. by the oil. Oh my god. Yes. If the Christian villagers had retreated this far into their underground, it meant they were desperate. And we were standing in the last room carved out in this complex. It was the war room for the defending army. The room from where the battle between 3,000 villagers and their heavily armed enemies was run. But how? What are these holes up here? Well, 
Please echo my voice. This is the only underground city where you see telecommunication systems. The echo in this room is much better than the other rooms. And it's gathered and through this hole up here, uh -huh. carried to the other floors. Like an acoustic theater, this room was built to reverberate sound waves and channel them into a single area. A person in the room above could hear instructions given below, even when spoken at a whisper. Orders and enemy positions and movements could be communicated throughout the complex, a last line of defense against a determined enemy. But even after the threat of an attack passed, locals would wait down here until they were absolutely sure the coast was clear. That meant living underground for months at a time, so preparation was key. This is the most important thing in an underground city. Right. They need to store food, even if they're not using it, even if they're up, up there in their houses, they store the food. Okay. And because they need it when they stay here. And it's a very good cold cellar, essentially. Yes, the temperature is perfect in these underground cities. The temperature down here was always the same, 15 to 16 degrees Celsius. It was the perfect temperature to keep food fresh, centuries before the advent of refrigeration. But the Christians went one step further than just storing their food. They knew any kind of contamination could quickly turn a subterranean city into a mass grave for 3,000 people. This is chalk. Uh, most of the underground cities had used this system to paint the walls with chalk paint. Most of the places like storages, kitchens, and uh, places where they need hygiene, uh -huh. they had uh, chalk paints on the walls. And this is an underground city where you can see the chalk. The volcanic tufa rock that created the landscape of Cappadocia flakes off easily. Its particles fill the air and cover everything in a layer of thick tufa dust. So coating the walls of their subterranean food storage areas, wineries, kitchens, even hospitals, with chalk was considered hygienic and helped to prevent contamination. The size and scope of Oskanok illustrates just how deadly the threat of attack was. And building this massive complex wasn't easy. In one day, it is estimated that one man using a chisel could only carve a five foot by five foot area. So an entire city, two and a half floors deep and one mile long, was quite a feat. But for those whose lives it saved, it was time well spent. Up next. Jeez, it's magnificent. Secret underground churches. Wow. Oh, it's really amazing. And later. Let's go down. Heading into a masterpiece of subterranean engineering. In the 4th century, Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And after centuries of hiding out in these subterranean cities, Christians could finally come out of the underworld. Even though the Christians were finally free to practice out in the open, they chose to stay underground, expanding on the subterranean cities and creating a Christian stronghold away from the eyes of the world, right here in Gareme. I was about to see the evolution of Christianity, hidden inside the caves of Cappadocia. Jeez, it's magnificent. It was hard to imagine that this valley was hiding hundreds of churches, from crude caves to intricate basilicas that rival the great cathedrals of Rome. But even more amazing is that this very site was one of the first Christian education centers in the world. This is the first monastery of the world and it's huge there are approximately a couple hundred churches around this area these caves were used to create the first monastery of the official religion of the largest empire in the world monks ate slept and prayed in seclusion here a solitary yet communal lifestyle like this had never happened before the idea of monastic life came from saint basil in the fourth century Christianity was at its peak, and he was alarmed by his own materialism. He had lived with hermit monks in Egypt and expanded on the idea. So here in Cappadocia, he created a massive self-sufficient community of monks, the world's first monastery. They lived here until the 14th century when the Ottomans took control. 
This subterranean solitary world is the basis of monastic life as we know it today. But that's not all St. Basil did here. He was actually able to excommunicate those involved in prostitution trafficking, so common along major trade routes like Cappadocia, essentially cleaning up the remnants of the area's pagan past. But of the hundreds of churches and dwellings here in this monastic complex, one specific underground structure stands apart from the rest. It is believed to be one of the earliest dwellings here in Gereme, dating back over 1,000 years. Today, it's a Christian world of the dead that's been dubbed the Snake Church by locals. This one is a very good example to the primitive church. Okay. This is a burial place, so watch your steps. Right. Don't fall into the grave. Okay. These are, are graves here, huh? Yes, these are the graves. Jeez. There were bones found inside these graves. Really? And, and these too, these small um, ones. Yeah, they're children's graves. Oh, wow. It's proof that an entire community of Christians, men, women, and children, lived in this very spot 10 centuries ago. But how is it still standing? Just like today, the 11th century Christians knew they couldn't just dig haphazardly into the hillside. So throughout the region, every 18 feet of digging required a supporting wall or column, and this monastery was no exception. This medieval form of building codes helped ensure the world's first monastery could survive 10 centuries later. When the Ottoman Turks conquered Cappadocia and stumbled upon this subterranean world, they were impressed with the engineering that kept these structures standing. And even more impressive, was that the ancient frescoes on the walls hadn't been exposed to the elements, preserving the stories of the world's first Christians underground. We have these famous Cappadocian stories painted on the wall. They are from the Bible, of course, but uh, these are local stories. All right. Someone tried to do a fresco, but you can't even see the face, you know, very primitive. But graves and crude frescoes are only just the beginning. Not far from the Snake Church, there's another church with even more elaborate frescoes. Oh, yeah. Isn't this beautiful? It's gorgeous. This church was built around the same time as the Snake Church, but its frescoes came later, showing just how much more advanced the Christian artists had become. These are local artists painting these churches, the intermediate ones. But very skilled hand. A very skilled hand, but you really don't see lots of color combination. Reds and blues, basically natural colors. And these churches were normally used to teach Christianity to illiterate people. That means this 1,000-year-old room was much more than a church. It actually doubled as a school of Christianity. In the Middle Ages, it was very rare to find people who could read. So these intricate frescoes were used like a textbook, telling the stories of the Bible in pictures. If this church was a message to the local people, the next one was a tribute to God himself. It was the biggest and most ornate of all the churches in Gereme, and for seven centuries it has remained intact thanks to the strong tufa walls into which it was carved. Oh, it's really amazing. Yeah, you can see the difference in sophistication, detail, the color, and ceilings are high. How beautiful. Yeah. Oh, this is spectacular. So this is the first part of the church from 11, 12 centuries, mm -hmm. and these are the frescoes about the biblical stories. So this is the life of Jesus from his birth to his crucifixion. There's so much detail, so much work involved. The frescoes on the ceilings and walls of this cave-turned church rivaled that of any church throughout the Byzantine Empire. Some of the world's finest artists were sent from Constantinople to paint these spectacular murals, a sign of Cappadocia's importance to this emerging religion. But it was the engineering used to build this church that was even more amazing. This is cathedral architecture. Right. I mean, the depth, 
and the height and their double layers of columns and mm -hmm. inner niches and they've gone to the trouble of the uh, detail. details. This church resembles the layout of those of the Eastern Roman Empire. It had an apse at one end to symbolize an opening to the Kingdom of God, a main central prayer area supported by four columns, and two smaller prayer areas to the sides. The design is similar to the churches found in Constantinople, but this one was carved into the ground entirely by hand. Driving by Gareme Valley in Cappadocia, few realize the holes in the hills lead to a massive monastery, the first of its kind in the world. From Christian classrooms and massive basilicas hidden inside caves, to blood-drenched pagan battlefields more than 18 feet beneath the ground, centuries of constant digging created another world here, and I had barely scratched the surface. Up next, Buried ancient technology that inspired engineering masterpieces. And later, a newly discovered secret left from the Silk Road for the first time ever on TV. Oh my God, it's a whole world in here. Turkey's largest city, Istanbul, is the only city in the world that is split between two continents, Europe and Asia. The Hittites, the early Christians, the Romans, and Mongols had all ruled Cappadocia, adding their own layers to its massive underground. Today, every house, shop, or road here could hide an entrance into one of these lost worlds. And Elvon was taking me to a town that sits on top of a five-level subterranean city extending nearly four miles. But it's not the size that's most impressive. The 1900-year-old architecture sits 20 feet beneath the ground and actually inspired some of the greatest engineering feats on the planet. Mehmet Azmanbashilu, the mayor of Ayanas, a small village outside the city of Kayseri, agreed to take me into the bowels of the sealed-off underworld. Let's go down. It just so happens that the best way to get down is through the basement of the childhood home of one of the world's most influential architects. Down here. His name is Mimar Sinan. After you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Wow. So, we are entering into his house here. This is where he lived. They say this is the place when he opened his eyes as a baby, he saw these arches. These arches here? Wow. Yes. So these were actually features of the house. These arches are very important because those are the influence to his uh, later life. Mimar Sinan, born in 1489, right here in this house, went on to build some of the most impressive monuments of the Ottoman Empire. His most famous was the Suleimania Mosque. It was built for Sultan Suleiman and standing 170 feet tall, it's the largest mosque in Istanbul. It has one of the biggest unsupported domes in the world. Amazingly, a building of this size could never have been built without the engineering feat found right beneath Sinan's childhood home. It's a triple arch system. This system builds on the same idea as the simple Roman arch. The weight from above is distributed throughout the sides. So with three arches sharing a central axis, the load-bearing capacity triples as well. It's a simple but ingenious way to make the most of a single column. But why was the triple arch used here in the first place? This underground city is believed to have been one of the newer ones in the region, first inhabited by the Romans in the second century. As each new generation moved in, they expanded the city both above ground and below. Nervous that the world up above could cave into the one below, they put triple arches throughout the underworld. The technique worked. 1900 years later, these second century walls can still hold up the thousands of pounds bearing down on it from the modern town that continues to grow above. And we go this way. But there's something else that sets this city apart from the rest. Oh, man, look at these little 
amazing spaces. I mean, it's like a set piece. Today, homeowners have blocked off spaces beneath their homes for storage. But 500 years ago, during Sinan's time, this system was an uninterrupted three and a half mile long subterranean factory. I cannot get over how vast this whole underground of this house is. Yes. I mean, and this is what kind of room here? They are making uh, iron utensils in this room over here. They melt the iron in that hole. Wow. The terracotta molds left behind were once used to make tools out of iron. But what was created in the next room was a matter of life and death. Now what is this room? What was this used for? It's a workshop, mm -hmm. and it's also interesting because uh, there is a pigeon house inside the workshop. Oh, really? You know why? Why? Because they're making gunpowder out of the pigeon poop. Many ancient civilizations considered pigeon droppings a precious commodity. Cappadocians had known for centuries that this bird excrement was high in nitrates, and they often used it as fertilizer. But after the invention of firearms, they realized this highly explosive substance was perfect for making homemade gunpowder. And over 500 years later, I was standing in the middle of a subterranean weapons factory. So Sinan lived above this, a whole working complex. A whole there. working complex. They believe living here and not being an architect is not possible. <laughs> this was a perfect laboratory this was a for perfect a great one. architect <laughs> exactly, yeah. to, to be raised among. Yeah, Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> this perfect laboratory for Mimar Sinan is an invaluable time capsule today. And few people know that everything from the beginning of ancient factories to arches that inspired the world are all right here, buried 20 feet beneath this village in Cappadocia. Up next, a fortified 13th century luxury hotel buried underground. In the last 50 years, around 200 underground cities have been found throughout Cappadocia and new ones are found all the time. In fact, just recently, archaeologists discovered another lost city, but this was no ordinary find. It may be the largest and most sophisticated underground city in all of Turkey. It's still being excavated today, but it may rewrite history. This latest discovery buried beneath Cappadocia is unlike any other. It's located in the town of Gaziamir, on the western edge of the region. The locals always believed they lived on top of another world, but they had nothing to prove it. So the government gave them three weeks to start digging and see what they could find. A group of villagers got together, and no sooner had they broken ground than they uncovered a time capsule dating back seven centuries to the dangerous days of the Silk Road. Wow, there's just new excavation everywhere here. Everywhere, yes, there, there, there. I can see all this excavation going on. Archaeologist Guzin Karuke is in charge of this one-of-a-kind dig. So this is the new underground city they found. The Silk Road was the major freeway of the ancient world. It was the lifeline that allowed people to get from one place to another, transporting everything under the sun. Incredibly, it extended 7,000 miles, which meant that rest stops were needed. And when it came to rest stops, the Turks went big. Here, beneath Gaziamir, sits a caravan sarai, or a fortified four seasons of the ancient world. Experts believe this complex might go back 800 years. This rest stop fell out of favor in the 14th century, and hundreds of years of dirt and debris buried it beneath the ground, until three months ago, when they cleared away the muck, All right. and exposed the newest piece of Cappadocia's past. So all of this was underground before. Today, we were the first to ever be given access into this unseen underworld. Well, off we go. Isn't this beautiful? Jeez. I'm so surprised to see a place like this. It's gigantic. 
But what was such a massive caravan sarai doing beneath Gaziamir? This village sat strategically on the busy 7,000-mile Silk Road. Caravan sarais like this one were built every 18 to 25 miles, the distance a camel could cover in a day's travel. It's hard to tell today, but 800 years ago, this would have been an impressive sight. Travelers from all over the world would have entered through a massive guarded gate. Security was always a major concern. Once inside, there were stables for their animals, storage room for their goods, sleeping quarters, baths, wineries, a central room where food was served, and areas for doing business. In essence, it was a city of its own. Caravanserais like this one cover 50,000 square feet, more than an acre. Without these caravanserais, long-distance trading would have been virtually impossible. Fountains, baths, and wineries where guests could unwind after a long day of travel made it well worth the hefty price guests paid to stay here. What is this here? That's, <laughs> that's the cork. <laughs> so this kept the wine yeah. safe? Yeah, yeah, that's the cork. How beautiful. But the luxurious life the innkeepers provided their guests was only a temporary escape from the outside world. In fact, in the 13th century, this entire region was sketchy. This four-star hotel was smack dab in the middle of a war zone. Most of the local villagers took refuge in the underground cities I had already seen. Travelers on the Silk Road needed security too. The Eastern Roman Empire was left weak and vulnerable by the Fourth Crusades in 1204. Muslim Turkish tribes had infiltrated the area and were constantly at war with each other and anyone in their path. And brutal Mongol invasions were always a threat. Not to mention gangs of thugs and thieves trolling for victims, looking to steal the expensive camels and their cargo. Wow, Don, look at this. Yeah. This is not like the tunnels we've been to. No, not at all. It's huge, for one thing. I mean, literally, the tunnels are big. The tunnels were used as corridors to get from room to room. At 10 feet tall, they were larger than most. Yeah, right. yeah. But they had to be. Asian camels used on the Silk Road could be as tall as 7 feet and weigh as much as 1,500 pounds. Oh, I see. It splits off in two yeah. here. The camels, the, the animals were taken out this way, <laughs> the slope. The big and... wide tunnel here. Yeah. <laughs> Travelers from all over the world, mostly rich merchants carrying their goods camelback, would have stopped here to rest after a long day of travel and trade. In this courtyard, they would unload their goods, everything from silk to spices, and tie up their animals. Animals were precious cargo, and they were well cared for at the caravan sarais. A staff of veterinarians, saddle makers, blacksmiths, and stable hands would have been on site. So this entire room is filled with camels. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I guess so. Oh, well, this looks like a bone. Oh, God, that's a jaw. It's an ancient camel jaw. And a top. Hey. Yeah. Oh, my God, that's a little gruesome, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> From the 13th century? Yeah, most probably. <laughs> I'm going to leave it right there. In fact, this archaeological site here is the only one in Cappadocia to have ever unearthed camel bones. Just three months into this dig, the archaeologists have already unearthed unprecedented relics from the ancient world. But they've only dug out a fraction of this caravanserai buried here beneath Gaziamir. As they continue to excavate, who knows what else they'll find. For now, the mud is the only thing separating the past from the present. Like ancient time capsules, these underground cities preserve Cappadocia's dark and mysterious past, from the harsh existence of the Neolithic era to the brutal warfare.